Food is a cornerstone of our families, our communities, and our country. And it's something that's on all of our minds right now. But with all of the uncertainty in the world, Canadian food is one thing we can be certain about. Thanks to you. All of you. From those who produce, to those who process, to those who get it on our plate. Canadians never shy away from a challenge. We always answer the call. Every Canadian has a role to play, and ours remains unchanged, providing safe, healthy food to Canada and the world. Food has always mattered to Canadians, but never has it mattered more. And even in times where the distance feels greater, food still brings us together. Thank you for your service. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Creating Farm Plans. There we go. <laughs> Organized by Farm Credit Canada. Come on in, have a seat, grab a virtual seat. Well, actually, don't grab a virtual seat. The room's virtual, but you, you're going to need a real seat to sit down here. We're glad you're joining us here today. My name is Kevin Stewart from Ag Vision Media. I'll be your, uh, your co-pilot, I guess, uh, for the session today. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Michael Von Masso, uh, just a couple of things really quick to uh, let you be aware of. First of all, let me start by acknowledging that uh, this country is home to diverse indigenous peoples whom we, we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land. Specifically right here, I am joining you today from the traditional lands of the Attawandaran, the uh, Anishinaabek, the Lenapewak, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. We're going to introduce our speaker, Michael Von Masso. He's an associate professor of uh, food, agriculture, and resource economics at the University of Guelph. He teaches you know, advanced agribusiness management to undergrad and grad students. Mike has really connected with the ag and food industries most of his career. And on top of that, he has a pretty strong presence in the, uh, in the mass media, as well as he has a podcast called Food Focus. Uh, Michael, welcome. Glad to have you along here. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, looking forward to our discussion. All right. Well, we've set you up. The platform is yours and uh, take it away. Well, thanks. I, 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 thanks for the introduction, Kevin. And I wanted to uh, thank and acknowledge FCC for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to come chat with you all today. And uh, those of you who are listening later, a special shout out to those of you from uh, my advanced agribusiness management class. Who, who may be participating today as well. Uh, uh, they did get a chance to get out of class today because I'm speaking, but uh, I encouraged them to come. So a, a special shout out to them. So let's talk a little bit about farm plans. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate the, that I may be uh, preaching to the choir here a little bit, that, uh, that if you decided to, uh, to spend an hour uh, talking or, 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 or hearing or talking about farm plans uh, without the fear of your eyes glazing over, uh, you probably already are relatively convinced that these are a good idea. But I'm going to talk about why I think uh, it's profoundly important now uh, to be having a plan and, and really talk about, uh, uh, let me just... I, I don't seem to have control of the PowerPoint anymore. Uh, so maybe if uh, we could get it advanced or, oh, now it looks like it's back. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so uh, I, I wanna, if, if, you're, if you're only gonna be here for the next five minutes, then let me give you my punchline right now. Three key points. Today, in the current environment for agriculture and food, being ready, preparation matters more than it ever has. It is, it is a time of significant change and a time of significant opportunity. And even if you don't anticipate making changes in your own farm business's direction or plan, having that sort of more concretely defined will help you navigate through these, uh, through these heavy seas of chain, change. The second point I want to make is that planning isn't a burden, right? We're, we're not talking about spending 
three weeks in a retreat somewhere immersed in a planning process it is an iterative process and it can take uh you know if if there was just one of you and me we could make a really good start on a good farm plan now in the next hour and then give you a foundation from which to build so that th this isn't this isn't onerous and and the benefits are many and the last point that i that i'm going to make over the course of the next sort of 20 to 30 minutes is that plans can and should change these aren't uh, these aren't carved in stone they aren't something that we put off put up on the shelf and never go back to again these are documents or or uh, thought processes that lay a foundation within which that we within which we can consider both opportunities and threats and and decide if this is a direction if this is consistent with the direction we want to go or if this is something uh, that uh, we can we can let fall by the wayside and those things can change as we go forward i mean those of you in western canada uh, had a significant drought this past summer that clearly affects what you might do on a day-to-day -day basis what you might do this year versus next year and and adapting to and changing in response to what happens is is not only uh reasonable but is is often necessary so i'll talk about what can change more frequently than others but but the bottom line is tactics will change more than strategy strategy may change from from unforeseen circumstances and and these shouldn't these these should, shouldn't sit on a shelf where you where you'll never look at them again so i get comments all the time when i talk about planning and and one of the ones i hear a lot today are things are changing so fast uh what's the point uh and and the the truth is uh again uh, you see it i mean a couple of uh, quick pictures here on the slides but the the, the one on the bottom left there is lots of things coming at you uh, if you don't have a good sense of where you're going those things can much more easily knock you off the rails they can much more easily send you in another direction so in fact when there are lots of things coming at us and lots of things changing it is the time more than ever to have a direction to have an idea where you're going and and i just like the other picture uh, change versus chance uh, with lots of things happening sometimes the foundation under you uh, can shift a little bit but if you have the foundation of a plan those those shocks to the system are much less likely to be significant the other comment I get all the time when I talk about farm planning is, I know where I'm headed, so what's the point of, of, of putting a plan in there? Well, the, the truth is, if, you've, if you know where you're headed to a significant degree, you might have already done some of that planning and then, uh, and, and then having it. And what I'm saying is there's some real value in formalizing it. And there's some real value in, in, in documenting it for a variety of reasons where you're headed and why, because it allows you to, to, to sort of measure your progress. It allows you to benchmark how you're doing. It allows you to evaluate uh, whether you're still on the right track in, in times of significant change. So what's changing? Like why, why, why are we talking about all of these things that are coming at us? Well, there's a few things I'm gonna talk about. You know, uh, costs are changing. These two graphs uh, present fertilizer prices that we're all aware of, uh, I'm sure. Uh, and you can see the, the graph on the left is Ontario. The graph on the right is global. Um, Ontario is at a 10 or 12 year high for fertilizer prices. Uh, and, and so we've got cost changes, we've got revenue changes. Uh, we need to be able to say what's important to us in the face of some of these changes, are we going to have to make changes to our own practice? Technology is changing. Robotic milkers for dairies, uh, autonomous uh, autonomous tractors that will do some of the field work for us, uh, drones which uh, can do things like spot spraying for us, 
uh, can evaluate nutritional requirements at specific segments of the field by photographing. At some point, uh, you'll have to evaluate whether this technology uh, makes sense for you on your farm and, and then make an assessment as to when and how to invest and whether to invest, frankly. And the reasons for it can be can be greatly different. I've, I've had the opportunity over the last couple of days to talk to a couple of dairy farmers who both recently put in uh, put in robotic milkers. And you would think, well, you know, that it, it's it's efficient. It sets dairy farmers free a little bit from the from the day to day uh, milking requirements. But these two individuals made the decision to invest in robotic milkers for substantially different reasons. The first individual is in his early 60s. Uh, he's got a son coming onto the farm eventually, but the son is working off the farm at the same time to try and build up some equity to buy into the farm. So they have an explicit succession plan. For him, the robotic milkers weren't about expansion. They were about taking a little bit of pressure off of his body and allowing him to have a little bit more freedom on a day-to-day -day basis from uh, from the early milking and the well i mean he's milking three he was milking three times a day had help one one of the milking and was doing the other two himself so for that person strategically they were thinking about what can we do to bridge the time till my son comes in full time and take it a little bit easy on my poor aching shoulders so the robotic milker in that sense made it made it uh, made a ton of sense in another case it was a farmer uh, who was a little bit smaller uh, who put in a robotic milker not to expand his dairy operation, but to expand his cropping operation. Uh, he put in the robotic milker, he gets the, he gets the notifications on his phone when things are going wrong, he walks the barn regularly, but he's not as tied to the barn twice a day and it allowed him to invest more in land and incre in increase his, his, crop, uh, his crop enterprise. So again, in, if you don't have a plan, you don't have a good way of evaluating what type of opportunity these technologies are. We've also got other changes coming. Uh, I already talked about the drought in Western Canada. We saw the floods in British Columbia. Uh, we're seeing more extreme weather events. Uh, if, if, if you'd have asked me two years ago, Mike, is there a chance for a pandemic to come uh, a, a global pandemic to come, I'd have said yes, but I would have said it's most likely to be African swine fever uh, and 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 those sorts of changes in in the global environment. And we need to be thinking about them. We need to be thinking about how we will adapt to them, and we need to think about how they will affect our farm business going forward. We're seeing different crops as uh, different products coming in lab grown meat cellular agriculture which can which which will be producing not only proteins like uh like ground beef uh, they're now growing muscle cuts on on lattices uh those aren't in the market yet and and they might not be for everybody uh we can grow uh we can grow uh casein and whey from uh, from yeasts and ferment uh, some dairy products. Those products are on the market in a sort of dairy-free uh, ice cr cream, or what do they call them, frozen desserts. Uh, and, and they have, uh, so, so cellular agriculture will be another choice for people. We're seeing a move towards plant-based. We're also seeing technology allow us to, to frankly customize both crops and and livestock to uh, through gene editing to do specific uh, to 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 have specific attributes and thinking about both how we feel about them and how we might respond to them becomes profoundly important. And customers are changing. Uh, you know, we're eating in restaurants more. That changed a little bit over the pandemic. We were probably at about 35% or 40% of our consumer dollar spent on food prepared outside the home before the pandemic. That's clearly come down. Uh, my expectation is that it will come back again and that it will go beyond. And we eat differently in restaurants. And restaurants uh, 
can shape to a significant degree how we as individuals think about food. They talk to us, they guide our decisions much more than a grocery store, which gives us all sorts of choice. We're seeing, uh, you know, we, we, we hear live in the livestock industry about, uh, about uh, more and more uh, uh, vegetarians and vegans. The truth is, the, that the that the core number of vegetarian and vegans is still relatively small and not growing to a significant degree. The much bigger impact is that there are people uh, in the rest of Canada, sort of the non-vegans and vegetarians, who are eating less meat. They're eating smaller portions. They're they're perhaps eating one meal or two meals a week that are are. Uh, uh, animal protein free and so that we're just seeing a greater diversification and 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 they're 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 thinking more about what it is and why they're eating we've seen uh, a and w talk about grass-fed beef uh, i'd be surprised if we didn't start seeing um uh some uh some food companies talk about uh quote unquote, sustainably raised crops, you know, talk about wetlands conservation, talk about fertilizer management and emissions reductions, and have those explicit claims, which means that they're buying those things from specific farmers and changing the way that infrastructure goes. Again, a, a lot of those things are out in the big space, but they will affect your opportunities as a farmer and you need to think about them and you need to think about how you might play in that new world so lots of things changing lots of things coming at us lots of lots of both opportunities and challenges but man mike i really don't want to spend the time to do a plan it just sounds like a pain in the butt i like to be out uh doing stuff on my farm, doing this planning process really just seems like a pain in the butt. And, and, uh, and, and, and it's hard for me to envision the value. I'm gonna spend the next couple of minutes talking about both what I think the value is and the fact that it need not be this sort of huge burden to you. It should be, and in fact, the research says that people with a plan have less stress. And so if you have it, an explicit plan, if you have an explicit roadmap, uh, you're much, it's much easier to respond to things. There's just less uncertainty and, and, and that you have less stress. To me, that's, uh, that, that in and of itself is enough value to do this. I'm going to make a little bit of a confession here too, uh, is, is that I am a notoriously bad planner. Uh, in our family, my wife is the one who is much, much better at sort of saying, here's where we are, uh, here's where we're, where we're trying to go to, and here's how we're going to do that, where I'm a bit of a ready, fire, aim kind of guy. And, and really what we do is we've come up with a compromise that allows us both to be happy. So I see the value in doing some planning. I don't agonize over all of the decisions like my wife does. My wife is the kind of woman, frankly, she's not around to listen, so I can, I can uh, give her a bit of a hard time. My wife is the kind of person who takes four years to decide which particular shade of beige to paint our bedroom. Uh, and I'm there going, well, I can't see the difference between any of those particular shades of beige that you're, that you're evaluating. So let's just paint the bedroom. And if it sucks, we'll paint it another color later. And so coming up with a compromise that, that works is important. And, and I've started, maybe not a plan for the bedroom from my perspective, but I've started to see some real value in, uh, in sort of having some common uh, visions and and I think that's one of the real benefits of a plan is that you have a shared understanding about where you're going uh, and whether that's with within the family or it's something that you share with your advisors your lawyer your accountant your banker and others uh, so they have a good understanding of where you're going not only does it make borrowing easier from places like the FCC but it also uh, makes it easier for those advisors to identify 
opportunities that make sense for you. If they have a sense of what's important, if you have a shared vision of what's important, uh, then identifying those opportunities becomes easier. So what are the, you know, you can, you can go on and Google and, and find uh, huge templates uh, and stuff, but there are really four basic steps uh, in, in the planning process. Where do you want to go? What do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, two, where are you now? What do you have? Three, how are you going to get there? Those three are the, are, are, the, are the foundation of the planning process. The fourth point is, how are you doing? Which allows you to say, you know, we have that plan, we have that roadmap, are we making progress? Are we, are we doing things that make sense? It's really that sort of evaluation phase. And that evaluation phase, how are we doing, is hard to do if you don't have somewhere that you're going. Like, it's hard for me to say, ah, I'm doing really well, if I don't have a sense of what doing well means. And so I think that that is one of the areas that we, we often run into stress is, uh, is how can I tell if I'm doing well if I don't have a measure of, uh, of where I wanna go or, or what's important to me? So there's lots of templates out there. Uh, uh, lots, of, lots of people will have resources, but you don't need, you can follow those and they may make it easier for you. But if you do that, where do we wanna go? Where are we at now and how are we going to get there? Uh, really are those three, you answer those three questions, you have the, the solid foundation of a business plan. So where do you want to go? You know, uh, there are people uh, who get glassy eyes when you talk to them about vision, mission, values. Uh, there are people who go, well, what do you mean about strategy? I'm not sure I understand that. Fundamentally, it doesn't matter what you call it. It doesn't matter whether you call it a mission, a vision, uh, or a strategy, uh, or a plan, or goals, or whatever. What it is, is an articulation of where you see yourself. What would you like? I always say to students, what do you want to be when you grow up? Where, where, where do you see, where do you see uh, getting to? And, and if you have that plan, uh, if you have that vision, then you can work towards that, and it makes it makes uh, it makes it much easier to get there if you articulate it clearly. When I graduated from my master's degree uh, more than 30 years ago, choke, choke, uh, I, uh, I thought, man, it would be great to be a faculty member. It would be great to, to, to be a professor. But at the, as I gra uh, a week before I defended my master's thesis, I got married. My wife is a dentist. Uh, is much less able to move. And that was important to me to get married. And, and so I said, well, it's, it's unlikely that I'll ever become a prof, uh, but at the very least, let's just put it off for a couple of years. We'll get you established in a practice. But then kids happened and a mortgage happened and I enjoyed my work. And, and, you know, I was having fun. I sort of on a plan that on a, on a, on a path that was, that was really positive for me. I was active in the ag industry. I had jobs that I enjoyed. Uh, but to, to take the next step in my job, I was going to have to go down to the US to the, to the corporate head office of the company I was working for. And that became very difficult for me. My wife made more money than I did. Our, you know, we, we couldn't just pull up because she had a practice that you, you, just, you, don't, you just don't leave. And so uh, the company said, well, we really like you. We're not going to fire you. We're not going to demote you. But your your path forward from here is a little bit more limited. And and so uh, at that point, I was just about to go work for another company. I'd been headhunted. It looked like a good opportunity. And my wife said, "Wait a minute, Mike. Uh, I know you're 42 or 43 now, or whatever I was at the time. You'd always said that your long term goal was to be a professor." why don't we think about seeing if you do a PhD now? And I said, oh, wait a minute. And again, because we had talked about those sort of long-term goals and the lot, we could go back and say, well, you're not going in the direction you want. Let's maybe think about doing that somewhere differently. So, so I think that there's a real, a real, a real value in doing that, in having that sort of touchstone, if you will, to say, is this taking me in the direction that I want to go? 
And if the answer is no, then you say, do I still want to go there? Or how do I change my direction? So it's simply a view of the future. Do I want to stay the course? Do I, do I want to retire? Should we be thinking about succession planning? Do I want to expand? Do I want to diversify like that the guy, dairy farmer who got robots so he could he so he could really indulge in his true love, which was crop production. Do I want to focus on efficiency, which is a cost to production formula? Do I want to focus on value added, where I might produce crops that are of uh, uh, that have specific characteristics for a specific market? But identifying those sorts of things uh, and making it explicit ensures that everyone's on the same page. So it doesn't matter if you say, "Look, I love where I'm at." and this is where I want to keep going, then say that explicitly, because again, then you're less likely to get knocked off course. Where are you now? That's not just talking about your assets. Oh, I have this tractor, I have this combine, I have this barn, I have these animals, I have... It's not just... But, but it's also looking at, at, at yourself and at the, at, at the other people in, the, in that business. What are you good at? Uh, what gaps might you have to fill to get to where you want to go? Uh, what do you enjoy or not enjoy? So if you hate something, uh, and if you hate it viscerally enough to say, I want to rule that out, well, then be explicit, rule it out, and then that will take you in a specific direction to get towards that. So taking a look at where you are now is not just looking at your financial assets, but that's important. Uh, it's not just looking at your physical assets, but that's important too. But but what are you good at? What are you bad at? And what other resources come to bear? So do you have kids who want to come to the farm? Do you have other other things that 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 are that are important to you uh, that that contextualize that affect the decisions you're going to make? And then, and then also looking outside. You know, I I talked at the beginning there mostly about internal. Take a look outside. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What do you, you know, what do you see admitting that things may change and, and things are changing, but what do you see as, uh, as the landscape outside within which you, uh, with, with, within which you want to navigate? So that's the, where are you now? What are you going to do? These are the tactics. I, I, I like to differentiate between strategy, which is the big picture stuff, and tactics, which are the specific steps along the way. Uh, I, I remember when I was a kid, uh, I, again, uh, those of you who hear this story will go, oh God, Mike, you're an ancient guy. Now people just put it into their phone, into the GPS. But when, we're, when I was a kid, uh, you could get the CAA to uh, do what they called triptychs, where they would build a map book for your whole trip, and they would highlight the trip and, and have different pages. Uh, I see Kevin nodding, you can't see him. That just means he's as old as I am. And, and, and I see some other people just looking puzzled. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just, <laughs> I'll say that you'd get this book and it would map out your, so the strategy was, uh, was where you were going and the triptych book were the steps that you would take along the way. You know, you would say, okay, I'm driving from Winnipeg to Guelph. I'm going to stop in Thunder Bay. Uh, I know how to get to Thunder Bay and I'm going to book a hotel room in Thunder Bay. Then I'm going to drive to uh, Sault Ste. Marie the next day. And, and so the tactics are those steps along the process. It's the roadmap and the milestones. Uh, and you can get input, right? Again, I think you have this, all of us in farm businesses have these immense resources that, can, that, that, that we can leverage. We have a good relationship with our accountant, with our banker, uh, our, our lawyer. Uh, often suppliers pay, play a big role in some of the cropping decisions or some of the nutrition decisions on our farm. Talk to people, they will have input. And, and this isn't something you have to do by, by yourself. And I, 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 and I wanna reiterate here, that it doesn't matter whether you're going to change. Doing this doesn't mean you're going to change. What it means is what steps are we taking to stay on track? And this can really very much validate, this process can validate that you're on the right track. And then it can, again, set a common vision or a common expectation of what you're doing going forward. And then, 
the real value of a plan is, is to say, how's it going? You know, where are we at? What, what, what are some of the benchmarks we measure? And really to me, this articulates to a significant degree the, the, the benefit of planning, right? You take the time to spend a couple of hours developing the plan, and then you take some time afterwards to evaluate, are we still above the, are, are we still on track to where we want? Do we have to make adjustments? Do we have to reevaluate? And, and this, this isn't unique to farm businesses. This, this is true for businesses all over the place. We often get so wrapped up in getting things done. We, we don't take a, a moment to get our head above the fray and look and say, are we still moving in the right direction? Are we still getting there? And that's what this how's it going step is, right? We stop, take a breath, you know, even if it's when we're running for parts and we take that breath in the car, we take a breath and, 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 and look up above and say, yeah, we're still going in, that, in the right direction. Uh, and and, and I, so many businesses I talk to, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, I do some work with some restaurant companies and a couple of them said to me, you know, the, the pandemic has been horrible for the restaurant industry and we all understand why that is. But they said to me, one benefit of the pandemic and of the pandemic shutdowns was that it gave me time to take a breath and evaluate how I am structuring this business what direction I'm going in and what I should do differently. And they said, the big lesson, the big learning for me is looking at what I might've done differently here uh, uh, and, and, and taking that time to breathe. And, and hopefully uh, as a business owner, you do that more than when you have significant disruptions. You take a moment, get your head above and say, are we going in the right direction? So plans can and should change. Uh, I often use the analogy of Moses coming down from the mountain with the 10 commandments carved in, in tablets of stone. Plans aren't carved in tablets of stone and they aren't, uh, uh, they aren't brought down from the mountain. They are living documents and should change. And, and they shouldn't be, and this is, I, I've worked for companies where we spent a pile of time doing a strategic plan and then never looked at it again and it got covered in cobwebs and sat on the shelf. And, and the truth is that it shouldn't be so big that it's hard to, to go back and refer to. It should be a simple enough thing that we look at it and we say, how can it, how, how are we doing? Are we still on the right track? And are we still going in the right direction? Uh, the plan is about the process and not the end. You don't put it in a binder, put it on the shelf and go back in five years and say, were we right? This isn't an exercise like Nostradamus. It is something that should be an iterative and ongoing process. It's good to write it down. It's not set in stone. Your circumstances may change. Your priorities may change. It means that changes are purposeful and considered. And, and they are really a touchstone for opportunities and challenges. When something comes up that's unexpected, that's not on the roadmap, look at it and say, how does this fit into the broader plan? Is this something that, is this not, the neighbor's farm comes up for sale. Well, if I, I had a guy tell me not too long ago, shaking his head, he goes, my long-term plan was to wind down and retire. The neighbor came to me one day and said, I'd like to sell you my farm. Are you interested? I bought it. And then I said later, what the heck have I done? Uh, you know, I've just taken on more work, you know, but my, my plan was to retire in five years. It was just, again, if I'd had an explicit plan, I could go back and say, is this consistent with that explicit plan? This is an opportunity that I didn't see coming. Should I adjust and take advantage of this opportunity or is this not consistent and, and I can let it go? It means that your changes are purposeful and considered. Really, really what it does is it gives you a filter, it gives you a touchstone to look at it. So changes are most likely in reverse order of the planning process. So tactics are more likely to change, 
your current circumstances are sort of second most likely to change and your priorities may or may not change. I was talking to a farm business a couple of weeks ago, Kevin talked about my podcast. I was talking to someone on my on my podcast, and and they had a they had a value added business on the farm, uh, and and uh, the wife and husband decided that it was more important to them to have a family and to grow the cropping enterprise. So they had an explicit plan. They had decided that they were going to have kids. They were bringing other people in and grow the farm. They put. Uh, that value added business on hold temporarily. They see themselves going back to it, but because they had they had originally planned to grow, other things changed. It's not just it, and it could be family things. It's fine to make decisions for family reasons. If you change the so so, I, I've got my next slide there. It says if you change the fundamentals, you need to revisit the following steps. So if you're changing tactics. The, the stuff that you did first really doesn't have to change. But if you're changing your priorities, if you're changing your goals, if you're staying, changing your strategies, then you need to revisit the, the tactics that you're using to get there. So if you change your destination, you should probably change the roadmap to getting, you know, if I've decided I'm going to go to Edmonton instead of Guelph from Winnipeg, I need to then not follow the trip to Thunder Bay. Uh, and so uh, if I if I didn't change that I wanted to go to Guelph, but I thought, oh, the snow is so deep across the North Superior, I'm going to go through Northern Michigan instead, that's changing tactics without changing strategy. Whereas if I say I'm now going to go to Edmonton instead of Guelph, then I need to change the roadmap too. So that, that gives you sort of a sense of where that is. This is a constant process, but I want to reiterate that it need not be a burden. This isn't something that's, oh God, it really is something that helps you be more comfortable it, uh, with, with the path you're going. It really should reduce your stress and it shouldn't take piles and piles of time. If you can't, you, you might have several pages uh, of a plan when you go see your banker uh, and are asking for money, uh, but if you can't articulate your plan to uh, your, your spouse or your kids, or to me, in in five minutes, then 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 you have an issue. So it's a it's about ability to check in. It's about an ability to benchmark, and it doesn't need to be this onerous burden or this binder that you you know creak open uh, uh, and uh, and and blow the dust off and and get overwhelmed trying to find the right page. So. That's, uh, I've gone on for probably long enough. Let's just sort of synthesize where we've been. Planning matters more in times of change, not less. And that's true whether you plan to change or not. Uh, I would argue that in, in times of this incredible pace of change like we're facing now, there are many more things that can knock you off your, your path so that it, it, it is now more critical than ever to plan whether you want to change directions or not. Planning doesn't have to be onerous and there are real benefits. Clarity, access to lending. Uh, bankers will tell you the, the more clearly you can articulate your plan, uh, the, the better they'll feel about the risk. If you have to bring people in, if, you have to, if you're planning for succession, not only does that come into the planning process, but it also gives other people some clarity on where you're going. And the last point is plans change, just do it on purpose, right? I, I, if, 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 if nothing else, do it that you've thought about it, right? Do it. Don't let plans happen to you. Make your plan, make your destiny your own. So that's the three points I started with. These are the three points I'm finishing with. I'm going to finish, wind up here with uh, some shameless self-promotion. Uh, if you uh, if you have questions, uh, I'm always happy to engage in a discussion. That's my email address at the University of Guelph. I'll do my best to answer as quickly as I can. Uh, I'll tell you this next couple of months are really busy because I'm teaching three courses, but I'm always uh, always do my best to respond. I'm active on Twitter. If you do uh, uh, and talk about issues of uh, re relative from agriculture and food, and as Kevin said at the beginning, I have a blog and a podcast. You can find it at foodfocusguelph.ca. 
uh, and I'm always happy to engage in a discussion on farm planning, on other things happening in agriculture. And I'll turn it back to Kevin, uh, and I'm looking forward to answering any questions people might have. Thanks very much, Mike. And, um, you know, I, I have been involved in planning type events like this before, and you really highlighted some things that I often think the same as some other people. You think, well, you know, in the midst of, of um, unprecedented change, part of you thinks, well, yeah, I know where I'm going. You made that comment or someone made that comment. I know where I'm going. So what is the point in change? And all of a sudden, I'm starting to see some things you mentioned about change that kind of challenge my assumptions. Like, for example, you made you said there that a plan is not about the end. It's about the process. And in my mind, the plan was always about, okay, our my goal is X. And so you need a plan to, to get to the goal. And I've never thought about the plan actually being about the process and the way you explained it, it actually makes a lot of sense because it, when you think about it, in the end, you and I actually don't always control the results. We can really only control what we do each day, uh, how we react, how we improvise, how we whatever. So uh, really impressed with that idea. Do you get challenged on that idea? No, you know, generally, as people think about it, uh, that 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 they they, I, I think it takes a little bit of a of of the pressure off, but but it also keeps people engaged in it. So generally, people go, "Oh, I hadn't thought about it that way," and and you know, there are so many things that happen along the way that if we're not willing and able to adapt, the 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 plan becomes very quickly irrelevant. So I think as people think about that in terms of, of, of process and in terms of, uh, of sort of just of it being, to, to me, it's almost a parallel track to operations that we jump to the other track once in a while to take a look at, you know, that head above the fray and say, are we still yeah. heading in the right direction? If we're not willing yeah. to do that, then we're often disappointed when we get to X uh, or as 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 likely we don't get to X either as quick as we want or ever, and, and we and we have to figure out why. So so uh, usually people when they think about it are are quite open to that concept of of it being the process and not the and not the not the the destination that matters. Right, and I think what you explained there, which makes a lot of sense to me. So now with a plan, the, the, the plan almost rather than becoming. Uh, an end in itself, it's the means to an end. It actually becomes a decision-making framework for me on a daily basis rather than, than the three to five year plan. And here's where we'll end up in three to five years if nothing changes. Well, of course, everything's going to change. And so I think that's maybe why we think of the plan as being sort of an irrelevant process. But if we think of if we think of planning as a decision-making process now, now when a new opportunity comes along or you look at an, an outdated piece of equipment, now you look at it through your plan you go, okay, I've outlined in my plan, you know, here's what's important to me. Uh, you, you know, we call them on our farm, our big stones, right? Big stones were the things that we didn't move. Yeah. Uh, and so, and legacy was one of our, what it was part of the plan, the story we're trying to tell. And now I understand what you're saying where we go, uh, this this can become a decision making framework now when a change is going to come, and now I can actually respond. Going oh, okay, based on my plan, based on our big stones, um, this looks like this is consistent with where we want to go, and, and this isn't. So I appreciate you explaining that. It's really quite impressive, actually. So, so um, Kevin, it, it, I'd yeah. never thought about it quite this way before, but but the way you just articulated it is is we should think about plan as a verb and not as a noun. Hmm. Uh, and, and so that it's something we're doing all the time and that yes. makes it less onerous and it makes it much more adaptable. And, and, and frankly, those big stones can change too. They're much less likely to change. You know, I was talking to a, a friend not long ago uh, who, for whom legacy was, was a big stone uh, and uh, they had a farm that had been in the family for 150 years. Uh, uh, and they had a breakdown of a marriage and had to sell the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really unfortunate. It was sad. It was heartbreaking. But it had to fundamentally change 
his his process, but he came to grips with it. At, was still sad, but said, here's how I'm going to move forward. So, so yeah. I think that again, I, I, I like the way you articulate it. It is, it is a verb instead of a noun. Yeah. It, it allows us when you think of it to improvise with maximum intelligence, because you know, we're all going to have to improvise. I, I like the statement that you made in there too, this idea. And I, and I think I used to feel this way too. And I, I'm sure there's some producers out there that feel that way. Like, what is the point of planning? Because I, I know where I'm headed. Right. What is what is the point? And so you just mentioned even in that statement, divorce. Right. And the other big D's would happen. Right. Death and disability, sometimes disagreement. And so this idea that, well, I know where I want to go. What's the point of planning? And, and which is fine. If you know where you want to go, that's great. But isn't it interesting that so much of of uh, the world we live in isn't really about logic or about things that are predictable. A divorce is not predictable. A death is not predictable. Uh, and, and, and even the market is so unpredictable now that you can't just say, well, this is where I'm heading. Well, what if nobody wants what, what you're going to, you know, for example, who would have ever predicted some of the goofy things that have happened out there that, uh, you know, of course, nobody predicted that COVID was going to happen. That created a left turn for, for everybody. But all kinds of other thing, crazy things happened. Like, a, you remember, it was a few years ago, the, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, uh, I think, the, the, the focus in food was more toward local foods and, and whole foods. And, all, and then out of nowhere comes this veggie, highly processed veggie burger kind of a, idea. I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just saying, who would have picked that? You know? So I really like uh, some of what you've said here. And, uh, but one piece I want you to expand on a little bit is the whole three to five year plan. I think we've all done that exercise. In this day and age, do you, do you do a three to five year plan? Do you even recommend it? Um, I, so I, I, I think the tactics that you, that you outline, uh, have to have sort of some sort of finite horizon, right? So again, that 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 three to five year plan might change in two months or in one year or you know in in two and a half years. So I think that again, it makes sense to think where you're going in the short term, the medium term, and the long term, and it makes sense to outline what you anticipate doing in that thing. Where I think we've run into trouble with the three to five year plan is that we've put it on the shelf and not gone back to it and not adapted. Mm -hmm. And if we get off the track of what that three to five year plan is, then we just started to ignore it and say, okay, here we go. So yes, I think that to, to answer your question is yes and no. The, the, the answer is yes, you need to think about short term what you're doing in the next little while, what's happening in the next couple of years and what's happening in the longer term. I'm, I just turned 59 years old. And so I, I'm thinking about what I'm going to teach in the next couple of weeks. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do as my research program over the next five to 10 years before I retire. And then I'm thinking in the long term, what do I need to think about in terms of my retirement? Now, like you say, hopefully no divorce, but maybe death or, you know, there, there are things that can come up that will knock me off, but then I'll adapt and, 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 and I'll adjust. And so, yes, it's fine to have those short, medium, and long-term tactics, but recognize that those might change uh, before you get to those three to five-year plans. So, so there's nothing wrong with having them as long as you're willing to adjust them. So uh, further to that is a question here that's asking a related question. So if, if we do sort of a plan as you've just described it there, it, so that it doesn't end up on the shelf collecting dust. Do you have like a, an idea of how often should you reevaluate this? And, and you know, I don't know, should you put it as your screensaver on your computer so that it's in front of you? Like how, how often would you uh, revisit it? Well, I, I think it, you, it depends on, it depends on what kind of business you are. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're a grain farmer, we have kind of an annual cropping plan. We have the rotational plan. You know, going back and checking them makes makes a, a ton of sense to sort of reevaluate annually. Uh, if you are if you are uh, uh, a greenhouse operator, as in it, where, where you have continuous cropping, I would say it's more frequent. Uh, so I would do in our house 
we do a quarterly sort of check-in. Uh, it gives us a reason to go out for dinner when we're allowed to go out for dinner. And we will have a quick check in and say, you know, what's changed? We still, you know, this, doing this, doing this. It's it's 10 or 15 minutes during dinner. And then we can just sort of talk about talk about other things that we do it explicitly quarterly, I think at least annually. The other thing that I think is important to to look at is opportunities come up. And when you're evaluating an opportunity, going back to your touchstone and saying, is this, you, you, you can spend a couple of minutes saying, okay, if this is an interesting one, but it's not sort of on that core, it's, it's sort of a side trip on our trip to Guelph, uh, that's fine too. And then you adjust some of the other things. So, so I think you should have some formal check-ins, right? You're also doing that benchmarking process, which isn't part, which is, sort of regularly checking in on how you're doing on your financial metrics, how you're doing on, on, on your other goals that you've, the, the sort of the milestones. I, I, what someone, when I was giving one of these presentations once said, do you mean millstones or milestones? <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and plans don't need to be millstones, but, but yeah. you have these milestones. It gives you the opportunity to do a check-in. And while you're doing that check-in, it also sort of gives you a, a minute to, to think about, are we, we're, is this still the right thing to be measuring? So have a regular planned evaluation that is sort of unique to your farm business and and recognize that there's going to be opportunities along the way where things change you know a drought happens or there's a an excellent marketing opportunity and 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 you'd need to sort of consider a new crop in the rotation or whatever uh, never be averse to to taking another look if you have the time yeah uh, another really thoughtful question here actually it reminds me of the saying and unfortunately i'm, I'm going to mess this up because i don't remember who said it but it's this idea that we don't decide our futures we decide our habits and our habits decide our futures. And so to that end, this question is asking you a, a question about good habits. They're saying, are there specific small habits that seem to improve the likelihood that I will create a plan and, and work with that plan? Do you have any tips to adopting some of these good habits, either daily, weekly, however, any thoughts on that? So, so, so I, I think I'm going to get back to where you and I started in the in the question conversation, Kevin. It is it is plan as a verb instead of as a as a noun. Mm. So don't sit down and then put it away. To me, having those metrics and then going back and saying, "Oh, yep, yeah, we're on track and we're still measuring the right things." Uh, I think the quarterly check-ins or the annual check-ins uh, are really good. I think that it's always worth. Even when you're not doing a formal check-in, when you're sitting for coffee or you're driving for parts or, uh, or you're driving home from the curling rink, whatever you're doing, taking yeah. that few minutes just to think again about not what you're going to do tomorrow, but about what's happening above the fray. And so to me, the, the most important habit is to stop, take a breath, and to look around occasionally uh, rather than you know, the head down, nose to the grindstone, get the thing, yeah. you know, I'm looking at my desk and it makes me shudder some days how long <laughs> my to-do list is. And, and I know I'm unlikely ever to get to the end of it. But what I do on a regular basis on Sunday nights is I sit down and I call my to-do list and say, that just wasn't a high enough priority. I'm not going to get it done. I'm not going to reasonably going to get it done. So I'm going to take, it's not important to me. It's not consistent with my short and long-term goals. I'm going to, I'm going to let it go. And, and that frankly is so liberating it, 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 but, but the risk is that I keep my head down and keep trying to burn through that to-do list. And I do the things that aren't as important. And I miss things further down that list that are critical for me getting to where I need to go. Uh, yeah. I, I, as an example, I haven't done my RSP contributions yet. And I have, you know, about two weeks left. And so that's been on my list. It's important. I want to retire at some point. And so doing, taking that time to step back and look above and say, what's coming what, uh, is critically important. So, you yeah. know, whether you do that, you know, just doing it consciously and doing it formally, maybe four times a year becomes, I think, the most important 
the, mo the most important thing. And that gets to plan as a verb rather than doing it and then moving yeah. on. And in terms of making it a priority, I've heard a number of leaders basically say it's it's so easy and, and natural to be tactical, right? I've got 57 things on the to-do list today. And, and, and mostly what I think when we're tactical, sometimes our mind just goes into autopilot. So we're not even thinking about, about things. And so I find personally, I actually book time on my schedule to be strategic. Now, whether it's because I have a two-hour drive to get to the city or whatever it is, but I do find that uh, that habit of actually booking time to be strategic, to think. Otherwise, like you said, we're stick handling with our head down sometimes because the to-do list becomes our taskmaster. There's a lot of questions here, so I want to get to as many of them as I can. Uh, they're asking here, and I, and I get where, where this question is going a little bit. So they're asking, how do you reconcile all the plans? It can be a little over because you got a strategic plan or you know a business plan, your operational plan. And, and they're saying, how do you best use high level plans when just simply faced with everyday decision making? I think we've partly touched on this, but any thoughts on how to simplify? Because there is a lot of planning that can be overwhelming in some ways. Yep. And, 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 and to me, again, if you're doing it right, there aren't a bunch of them, right? Okay. There, there, there are different degrees of detail. Right. And so if you're going to your bank with a business plan that 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 has to check the boxes with your lender that, that gives them the information you have, if that's different from what you think your plan is over here, you're, you're doing both your banker and yourself a disservice. So so there are different degrees of 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 detail. There are different degrees of focus and how you might present the information. But consistency is the consistency is important. Right. So to me, the business plan that you develop for your banker is a tactic, right? It is a tactic so that you improve your, your, you, you either get more money or you get better, better rate or whatever. Uh, it, it, and, and so to me, to me, that's a tactic. The, the umbrella under which it is, is uh, so if your strategic plan is different from your business plan, there, there's a problem. And, and again, don't get lost in the details think about what, why we're doing this and what's important and what the end goal is so that the detailed business plan you write for your banker or for, or for your lawyer, if you're, if you're doing some succession planning, that should be a reflection in more detail of, of, of the overall planning process. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think that, that we often say, okay, we need to have a, a plan that talks about where, where we're going and we need to have a business plan that gets us money for operating or to buy that new, that new farm uh, or, or, or whatever. But if they're not linked, then all you're doing is adding to your stress rather than relieving your stress. So, so, so right. really I have one umbrella and how I sort of communicate it for different areas is, is, is dependent on the audience for that. Got it. Yeah. We're just about to the top of the hour here and uh, we're going to need to wrap up. But there is a question here that that maybe I'll try to squeeze one more in here because it's kind of important. And I think a lot of farmers face this and it's the it's the absence. It's the absence of key information in order to make a plan. So, for example, this question suggests, for example, that uh, the homestead generation, first of all, don't want to move forward until they die. That's the absence of some key pieces of, of the plan. Another piece of it is that the business partner, a sibling, doesn't want to communicate, right? And another big piece missing is that the children are under 20 and they're not sure what they want to do. So there are three examples of big chunks that would make up a plan, but you don't have any clarity on those big chunks. Any ideas? So you can only control what you can control. Uh, and and so uh, if you have some uncontrollable things, you acknowledge those things uh, and 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 say in that environment, what can I do? So uh, I had I had a gentleman, a friend of mine, come to my class the other day, and, and he spoke about uh, his business and the business he's grown since he graduated. Uh, and he said. When he graduated from, from high school, he didn't, or graduated from Guelph, he didn't want to go back on the farm, but his parents said, we will keep the farm in this condition so that if you want to come home, you can. Uh, 
So mm -hmm. they said, we understand that uncertainty, uh, but we're going to keep that option open. Uh, and so in some circumstance, you know, uh, I talked to another student who, 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 you know, Kevin, who said that we were very clear early in our process to our parents that we didn't want to go home in the, to farm. And so having those conversations, you talked about the sibling who, who doesn't want to talk, having those conversations uh, can, or, or, or having a plan and talking about the gaps in that plan becomes uh, uh, often a, a good way to open that conver conversation. So plan for what you can control and say there are, I mean, we can't control our yield next year. We can't control what, like you said, whether we're going to drop dead, but we can say within our circle of influence, our circle of control, uh, let's make decisions that, that, that are best. And, and if we're unsure, but we want to keep that opportunity for our kids then we have to plan one way. If if our kids are definitive that they won't want to come back to the farm, we plan another way. So so just yeah. just managing those uncertainties becomes important, and having a plan can can help reduce the unease associated with that uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that. That's that's all really good, you know. Because when you think of it, right now we're in a time where we're all desperate for some some certainty, and and we can't offer it because. We can't predict the future, but I can see we're putting a plan in place, having the big cornerstones or at least some of the big cornerstones in place, at least doesn't create certainty, but it does create clarity for, for now yep. uh, of, of how to move forward. So Mike, I guess we'll have to leave it there. I appreciate your insights uh, with us today. Also, thanks to those of you who uh, have taken the time to as, uh, as Stephen Covey says, sharpen your saw and uh, and learn something new about planning today. A quick reminder that if you registered in a couple of days that you will receive an email from Farm Credit Canada, and there's going to be at least, there's a few links going to be in there. One of the links is to the recording of this event so that you can watch it over because Mike packed a lot of a lot of information in there so you can watch it back. Uh, or you can share it with friends if you'd like or family. And uh, that's what that link will be for. There'll also be a link to the evaluation of, of this event. So FCC really appreciates uh, the topics that they cover, the way they cover them, any feedback that you might have. And thirdly, there's also going to be a link sent to you for, uh, and I didn't get a chance to talk with Mike about this, but it's a new free online course uh, from the University of Guelph called Foundations in Agricultural Management. This is actually a partnership between the university, between RBC and FCC. But basically, it's a free online program that explores ag business strategy, business planning, uh, farm management, like we talked about today, business planning, succession plans, financial fundamentals. It's a very unique uh, program, and uh, you will receive a link to that uh, in the days ahead. And with that, on behalf of FCC, thanks for joining us today. Glad you were along and we'll talk soon.